I am now going to be desoldering the parts from an old GameCube controller. I use a desoldering pump, I use a pair of fine tweezers, and a soldering iron. I also have fresh solder to add, if need be. First I am desoldering the rumble wires. Once the rumble wires are off, you can take the rumble motor out, and that frees us to remove the rumble bracket. Pull the wires off the rumble bracket, unclip the bracket from on top of the potentiometer sliders, and pull it off. At this point, I'm going to be desoldering the C-stick cable. I'll use my solder sucker now, so I can remove the solder from each wire. Now the cable is free, and I can clean it up. The strands of wire using tweezers and pliers. You want these wires to be pretty clean. You don't need to recover these wires. You can use brand new wires, but I find it convenient to use the ribbon cable. Right now I will unclip the potentiometers from the stick box on the C-stick and I will use a JIS screwdriver to unscrew the screws on the stick box holding it in. And now I will just put the screws right back in. Likewise, I will do the same on the main stick box. and set it aside. 
the next thing we want to harvest is I'm going to harvest the remainder of the C-stick cable. Once again, I will use my solder socket for this. I'm going to reposition my vise to make it easier to apply force. You can still see. Okay. the cable is now free and I'll set that aside. Next I will desolder the potentiometers for the triggers. At this point, it should be simple to gently push down on the potentiometers and they've fallen out. And now we will set them aside. The next step is to desolder the trigger paddles. On FOB 1.2.2, we have custom made trigger paddles with gold contacts instead of carbon and they also support Omron mouse switches but this is a I'm, I will be building a 1.1 point uh, 1.2.1 which does not have those and so I need to harvest these 
I'll set these aside. Next, I'll reposition the vise so that I can desolder the Z button. Now let's see if this comes out. There we go. We have our Z button. And I will, once again, put this aside. And the last thing you need to harvest is, of course, the cable. There are a lot of these that have to be removed at once, so it is best if you try to get them as clean of solder as possible so that there's as little resistance to removal as possible. Let's see if they come out. Not quite. You can try heating and pressing down on them one at a time. They have a little bit of independence of motion, so you can work them work them out of the PCB like this. Go back and forth. And eventually it'll be low enough that you can just work them out. And there we go. This is a demonstration video for assembling a FOB GC 1.2. This is a prototype board 1.2.1. While many of you watching will be building 1.2.2s, many of the steps will be completely identical, but there are small differences. 1.2.2 has slightly adjusted footprints for the D-pad for optional buttons, which sit on the D-pad and make inputs more reliable. 1.2.2 also moves the rumble bracket attachment in order to not pinch the wires. 1.2.2 adjusts the spacing of the Hall effect sensor uh, footprints, which allows a wider range of adjustment for those. And I think that's it. Maybe these were adjusted. For now, though, we'll be beginning by installing a, an already programmed TNC 4.0. First, we'll move all of our other parts aside for the time being. I highly recommend you start by programming the TNC4 while it's in its anti-static bag, because this lets you verify that it's working before you 
uh, solder it to your valuable Bob GCC board. You need two rows of 14 pin low profile headers. In this case, the low profile part is the thickness of the insulation. Unfortunately, they're kind of expensive, but you can get away with spacing the teensy away and gluing pin and soldering pins in uh, that are longer otherwise. But in this one, I will be using the recommended board, the recommended pins, so I won't need any modification. So as you can see, I've put two pins in on the end. These provide power out from the teensy, and I've put uh, two rows of 14 pins in, which connect all the other pins. And now, I will begin soldering. After taking a picture. Next, examine the board closely to make sure that you don't have any shorts and that all of your pins are soldered and all pads are fully wet out. At this point, we flip the board over and what I like to do is I like to rest the board against a pair of wooden clothespins, which helps keep the teensy in place when it's upside down. 
what we're going to do now is we're going to take flush cutters. Where are my flush cutters? Right here. And clip these pins until they're completely flat at the surface. You can use flush cutters like this, which are not quite flush. They have a slight lip when you left when you're left there, but I have nicer flush cutters, so I'll be using these. And you just rest the cutting edge flat against the surface and trim them off one at a time. At this point, the pins should be completely flush to the board when your TNC is held up against it. And now I'll begin soldering these. As with on the top, I like to solder each corner individually first to anchor it in place. With this, feed in enough solder to get it fully wet, but not enough solder to make it stand proud of the surface. At this point, I can now clamp it back in the, the usual PCB clamp. If you put in a little too much, you can heat it up and use your solder sucker to remove it. <laughs> 
you're wondering why my solder joints are turning dull after I, they cool down, that's because I'm not using leaded solder, I'm using SAC305 alloy, which always does this. So don't worry, in this case I'm not getting cold solder joints. And that's it. I've now soldered in my TNC. The next step that I take in assembling the FOB GCC is to install the trigger pots that were harvested from the donor GameCube controller. These slot in on the back side of the motherboard. Do not put them on the front or else you will have a bad day later. I like to rest it, adjust the sliders so that it's resting on the bottom and then I'll solder in the bottom legs. At this point, once one bottom leg is in, I slide the sliders back to the top and begin working on the actual electrical contacts. To reduce the heat load, I prefer alternating between the two potentiometers. I'll also go back and solder on this leg. Double check that they are laying flat. All four legs are firmly against the board. And then finish it off. Next, I will mount the Z button. The Z button goes on the top of the board, unlike the potentiometers sliders. However, as a result, you have to solder it on the bottom. If you'll look closely, the legs only touch the outsides. So what I will do is I'll put the solder on the outside edge. Be generous with the solder because it's structural. And then once the legs are on, then Connect the contacts for the switch. This is the process I take when mounting magnets onto my T3 stick boxes using magnet holders. These are 3D printed magnet holders. Uh, you can get the STLs on as pins in the FOB Discord. And these ones are for uh, KNJ DH1H1 magnets. So they have a square opening on top and an, an oblong rectangular opening on the bottom. And the rectangular opening on the bottom goes on the rectangular opening, the rectangular pin that the potentiometer normally clips onto 
on these stick boxes. So I will press these on using the clothespins that I use for soldering because they spread the force out nice and evenly and are very convenient. Now we have the magnet holders on the stick box, and now we just need to install the magnets. And the easy way to do it is I take a string of more magnets than I need. I only need four technically, but the extra ones give me a nice place to hold it. And I hold it right over the magnet holder, and boop, in we go. Line it up, and just press it right in off of the tail of magnets. Super easy. And now I put the rest of my magnets back in the bag with the rest of them. Next, I will be mounting the Hall Effect sensors onto the boards, both the C-Stick board and the main motherboard. If your Hall Effect sensors came in what's called tape and reel, I highly suggest you attempt to you cut these off rather than attempt to pull them off of the tape because it is extremely tough and I have broken Hall Effect sensors before. If yours came in bulk, where in which case they'd just be tossed in a bag, you don't have to worry about this. The next thing to do is you want to bend the leads to a 90 degree angle facing down so that the uh, kind of rounded beveled side of the sensor is facing up and you can do that by gently grabbing the head of the Hall Effect sensor and using your fingers to as clo closely as possible bend the leads down. The other thing to watch out is make sure that when you bend them, the leads remain perpendicular. Otherwise, you'll get some asymmetry in your readings. This one needs a little de-skewing. Next, we will slide them into their footprints on the boards. We suggest with these larger magnets that you put them fairly low down. On this prototype board, the spacing of the holes is a little bit smaller, is a, a little bit too wide relative to the spacing of the pins on the actual sensor, but in a later, in 1.2.2, I believe this has been rectified and the, it's easy to lower the sensors all the way down to the surface. It is, however, not strictly necessary. So at this point, what you do is you try to make sure that the sensor remains perpendicular. Some of this can be dealt with by installing the stick box. Make sure you use 
the black stick box for the C stick because that's where it came from. And the white, the stick box with the white bottom for the main stick. Make sure you put the magnets on top of the Hall effect sensors and screw it in. If you have a T2 stick box, the metal one, which we don't recommend, although they work, you'll have to solder in all the corners. However, T3 stick boxes are much more long lasting, less likely to have wobbly sticks, and they're easy to replace because they screw in very easily and unscrew very easily. The next step is to solder the ribbon cable onto the C-stick board. Make sure your pins are neat so that they cleanly fit in holes. and then simply solder as usual. Once that's soldered on, we will attach it to the main motherboard. Make sure you line it so that align them so that both are facing up, like so. Next, we take our uh, trigger paddles and install them on the back of the, of the board. These can be a little finicky because the wires are thin and prone to falling out. When you're soldering, make sure to heat both the board and the wire before you apply the solder. On 1.2.2, you will have the option of an upgraded trigger paddle, which has gold contacts and a mouse button, but I don't have the, these yet. Um, so for now, I'm just using the OEM trigger paddle. If you are using the, the FOB's new ones, you will have to supply your own wire, preferably. <laughs> 
with these, it doesn't matter which wire it hit, goes to what, unlike with the C-stick where you want them aligned. So just put them in however they go in neatest, and you'll be fine. Next comes the all-important GameCube cable. On OEM cables, the black wire goes farthest away from the center of the controller, and the blue wire, which is 3.3 volts, goes closest to the center of the, cable, of the controller, like so. And it plugs into the back of the PCB, and then you'll solder on the top. Finally, the last soldering step, which is best done after the reinstallation of the rumble bracket, um, is reinstalling the rumble motor. When you're installing the rumble bracket, I find it helpful to cut off the tab that sits right next to, right on top of the Hall Effect sensor pads. So I will just take it and trim it off with my flush cuttings. and then feed your trigger paddles in. If you have mouse buttons on your trigger paddles, you will also have to clip off this overhanging piece. Uh, but I'm using stock trigger paddles, and or if you're not using mouse buttons, then you don't have to do that step. So feed them in. Make sure the wires are not caught underneath which this one is, so I'll pull it out. And snap it down. It won't stay down quite as neatly as it does on the OEM controller, but that's okay. At this point, we just need to plug in the rumble motor. On the 1.2.2, these pads are changed from through hole to surface mount and they're moved from here to here because on the controller there's a rib that runs right across here. On my 1.2.1, therefore I have to cut this rib in order for the wires to not be crushed. I will just blue tape the wrong bracket down for the time being. 
there it is. All of the soldering is now complete on the FOB GCC.